name is Ed Shady. We're here at the Cardiometabolic Risk Summit in Las Vegas, and I'm here with Dr. Tom Rickey. And Tom is from Detroit, Michigan, the Henry Ford Hospital there. And he does some very interesting things that has some interesting concepts and that deal with adherence and motivating our patients. And also has a five-point plan to help us do that as clinicians. Do you want to talk about that? Sure, I appreciate the opportunity, Ed. Uh, let me do, uh, yes, the five pillars, the essential five pillars for healthy lifestyle change has worked as a tool to help patients make changes in uh, steps by step in ways that are all integrated and interrelated. The five pillars are, of course, healthy nutrition and physical activity. How could we get away without those two? Probably one of the most important we've been recognizing as we evolve the program at Henry Ford Health System are mind matters. So these are issues, depression, anxiety, poor sleep, issues of binge eating, etc. Our behavioral health the colleagues have been very helpful in that regard. Environment, to expect that willpower will take over and that we can just make choices based on that alone without a healthy food and social support network. And lastly, but not least, is accountability. So accountability certainly helps to keep people aligned with healthy uh, changes and of course come to our support sessions and so forth with pedometers and keeping track on uh, food loss. There's multiple ways we can practice accountability. And when one of those areas is weak, it typically saps energy from another. If we have a poor home environment for food, it's going to be very difficult to strengthen and address our nutrition pillar. If we exercise more, we may notice that our depression symptoms reduce. So it really goes both ways. Um, I, I really like what you said in the five areas, but what I'm thinking of a busy clinician, mm -hmm. and I still got to treat the blood pressure, treat the cholesterol, et cetera, et cetera, got to be here and make it. So how do I work that into a busy practice? Do I do it all myself? Do I have somebody help me with it? Uh, well, you could get a level provider to help you with it, but I think how it helps clinicians is in the same way as patients is to give them a choice because we are really trying to uh, become a, uh, a uh, really what is, is going to be a, uh, a, a co-pilot or a navigator. They are, the, they are the pilots of their own journey. They need their autonomy. So you could simply ask them, well, we have five major areas of lifestyle change. Which one do you want to talk about today? Pick one thing, and we'll, we'll work on that one step at a time, and it'll likely help others. So what do they usually choose? Is there anyone specific? My, you know what? Mind matters comes back time and time again. Doc, I know what to do, I know what to eat. Uh, and then frequently what they're interested in, even though they, uh, because I'll give them some examples, is environment that they get to get rid of this badge of honor, of willpower, that you know, you're not alone. Uh, Dr. Brian Watson of Cornell has written a great book, of Minus Eating, Why We Eat More Than We Think. If you modify your environment, can be a lot smoother ride as far as making nutrition choices. So those two areas, I think, are the ones that are the biggest uh, focus for patients they're interested in. I noticed in your slides you talk you talk about adherence and how to motivate people. We call motivation interview. Do you use that as a tool with any of the five pillars? Absolutely, yes. Now, motivational interview is not necessarily being motivating, and we can all be raw raw. The motivational interview is in a sense finding out what the patient's true motivations are. Working with them and where, as Dr. Timothy Harlan likes to say, meeting them where they are at. Uh, so certainly we use that type of model and we really help other clinicians and our whole team uh, understand where patients are, their readiness, their stages of readiness for change. As clinicians, we can burn out if we expend a lot of energy in someone we just truly would love to make lifestyle changes, but they're not ready and they're there for a call. Well, ask permission, say you're concerned, and then you'll build trust and maybe we'll talk about it later. But if you put all that energy into someone who's not ready, you could actually be counterproductive in terms of establishing trust. And the next patient that is ready is waiting for uh, Dr. Shahidi or Dr. Fida coming all energetic is now been sapped by a, a rather uh, a misappropriation of our uh, equity in terms of energy for the day. So I can't help but feel that, that you are really a caring physician to want to do this because, you know, I hear the word non-compliant for some of the people who aren't able to make it. And I mean, sometimes docs are angry with the patients. You teach this a lot. You're teaching here at this conference. So how do you help us? Maybe I think it's an issue. I don't know if you think it's an issue that, that we're angry because we don't know what to do. With them. How do we deal with our own frustration so we can get at their frustrations? Well, realize that we are DOC, not GOC. Uh, first, like a, first and foremost, we have to realize we're human and Dr. Heal thyself, and we have only so much energy. Do every bit counts when they make lifestyle changes. So every bit that you can do for a patient in any way, if it's, a, if it's prescribing the appropriate antibiotic or not, if they don't need it, right. all the way to therapeutic lifestyle changes. Celebrate the wins, just like they should, whether their blood pressure comes down, but their weight doesn't celebrate that win. We 
have to be more economical in what we can do. We really have been taught that we can do probably more than we think, and yet I think we have a true opportunity to break the, to fill the gap by using motivational interviewing and a five pillars model so that we can break things into pieces and realize it's still going to help the big picture. Every little bit counts. I, I feel that sometimes we feel as if we are dealing with clinicians like ourselves that we uh, we, we sort of feel that the patients, uh, we, we're afraid to give them control. It seems like the model you're talking about is really giving control of them. Let them say, if they want their A1C, they're okay with eight, I'm going to be okay with eight. Does that make sense? And how do I deal with that? One, 100%, at least as long as you explain to them the benefits and risks, mm -hmm. uh, that they are, they are willing, after you give them, that's what our job is, that information. I'm here to give you information on what can help you. I'm not here to dictate to you. I'm here to provide you guys. I'm here as your coach. I really am your coach. I will do whatever you're ready to do, and I will do no more because I respect you and your autonomy. My job was to provide you just objective risk, not judgment. Uh, I'm not perfect either. I am. I told you this last time. I'm a, I'm a recovery binge eater. Uh, I let them know that. I don't want to over-identify with patients, but I like doctors to begin to be willing to talk about some of their own vulnerabilities to identify. Not over-identify, but identify enough and let them be uh, uh, their own pilots. I think in, in that case, ironically, you actually get better results. You know, even if they're not perfect, as Tim said, right. don't let don't let excellent be the uh, the uh, uh, the enemy of, uh, or don't let perfect be the enemy of excellent. Great, great information. Thank, Thank you for talking to us.